sure that Keith has told him that we're up and running. I think he is. Trying to go to Al and on the system. Hello. Good morning again, folks. Uh, welcome to those of you who are at the earlier program this morning, and welcome to those who are you, of you who are joining us for the 930 program. Uh, my name is Bob Fadler. I'm the Education Director here at ROA, and we do many, many programs throughout the year. Welcome you to go to our website at www.roa.org. Uh, look under Events, and you'll see our list of programs we've got coming up. I will highlight just one program very quickly before I make an introduction, and that is uh, a week from now on the 27th, uh, we're, we're engaged with a series of programs called Defining the Threat, and we're doing this with the American Enterprise Institute and the Institute for the Study of War. And uh, the leaders of the project are Fred and Kim Kagan, uh, respectively, from AEI and ISW. But they've assembled an, a marvelous group of scholars to work on defining the threat. We're going to focus on Iran and Syria on the 27th. We'll be here in this room at noontime. We'll have lunch about 11.40 or so. Uh, a series of quick, hard-hitting briefings, and then Q&A, wrap up no later than 1.30. And so you're all invited to attend that. Now, it's my privilege to introduce our Executive Director, uh, Major General Retired Andrew Davis. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. And let me add my welcome and uh, good morning to uh, those who have just joined us and to our audience on our webcast. Uh, even, even though I am a uh, United States Marine of 38 years service. I'm actually a graduate of the United States Army War College. And I was in the last class that was not accredited to get a master's degree. So professor, I don't know if there's anything that you can do with that, but uh, help me build my resume. Uh, ROA is really delighted to uh, partner with uh, the Army War College on this forum and hopefully forums to come. Uh, we've had a very close relationship with the college, both uh, geographically and intellectually. Uh, these forums are actually uh, a great venue for the exploration of important ideas and issues facing uh, our nation and our nation's defense. Uh, just by point of perspective, ROA is a 90-year-old organization that was founded in 1922 by Army General Blackjack Pershing, uh, who saw the need for an organization to advocate for a strong national defense. And that is actually our congressional charter uh, signed by um, our, one of our uh, initial members and later President of the United States, uh, Harry Truman, whose portrait is on the wall. Uh, welcome to uh, the Minuteman Building, uh, the nation's uh, closest non-public building to the United States Capitol. Uh, just as a bit of uh, our uh, a bit of a commercial, uh, if you you or your organization are looking for space to hold a meeting that would attract an audience of uh, the thought makers and decision makers on Capitol Hill, we're open for you. Uh, another uh, little commercial, uh, and this is free, actually, this is a good deal. Uh, we, we have a service that's called ROA Smart Brief that is a free daily email that is sent to you either on your PC, your iPad, your, your smartphone, however you receive emails. And, and it's a daily digest of the 10 most important stories on defense of the day. Uh, sort of an early bird light, those of you who have access to the early bird, uh, which is shrinking uh, in access, but uh, know that there's a couple hundred stories and you can spend the better part of a morning going through the early bird. Well, this take, we have two human editors who call out the 10 most important stories, write a precy and a headline, and then uh, at two o'clock it comes to you. In order to sign up for it, all you have to do is go to www.smartbrief, one word, dot com slash ROA. And it'll ask you for your email address. And if you, and it'll also ask you for more information, which you don't have to give us. If you do want to give it, that's, that's great. Um, but uh, it, it's a terrific service. Uh, we've got 
uh, maybe 15,000 subscribers now and nobody doesn't like it, so uh, please join. Uh, having said two commercials and a welcome, I'd like now to uh, introduce uh, the moderator of this panel. Uh, Peter Husey is a, a great friend of ROA and our defense education forums. He is a highly recognized expert on the field of uh, missile defense and uh, national defense. And I'd like now to call Peter up. I see you look sort of ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Peter Husey. Whoa, careful. <laughs> you have to have steps here. We do, our other side. <laughs> I want to thank you for being here. A uh, couple of things. Uh, we're going to have some very interesting remarks this morning from the War College, from John Denny, who is going to discuss the Army's role in missile defense, but uh, Jim Thomas and from CSBA and the tradition of Annie Krepinovich is going to talk about the flip side of missile defense for the Army is what about offensive missiles? And I've read your piece in Foreign Affairs and I was taken by how you you broke a lot of China, which is good. And then Steve Pfeiffer has, Ambassador Pfeiffer has an impossible job. And that is to persuade the Russians that missile defense is really in their interest, that it is not contrary to what they're doing. And yet at the same time, when you tell the Russians that you're willing to concede something to them to get their help, uh, they're happy to eat the entire corral of sheep and cattle and come back for And what I hope we can do with this uh, forum is to see if there's a way to move away, which, which I think is in, almost inevitable that we see this problem as a Russian-centric, U.S.-centric relationship. Um, that's number one. Number two, Bob Kaplan, who has written a number of books, one of them Monsoon and another recently about what he calls, he uses a phrase, he says, the geography from North Korea to the Middle East is one of overlapping missile ranges. And he says the weapon of choice of all these countries are ballistic missiles. The second thing is, when we talked in the Reagan administration about terrorists getting missiles, we were kind of uh, what Les Aspen used to call the snicker factor was prevalent. But if you take a note to remember that Hamas launched more rockets at Israel in the months of December and November of last year than all the rockets that Nazi Germany launched at Britain in all of World War II. Rockets can be used for blackmail. They can be used for coercion. They can use, be also used as adjuncts for diplomacy. They do not have to be fired to be used. General Chilton, our former Strat commander, I think put it best in one of my seminars that he one of his last speeches, he said, I want to give the President of the United States an option other than surrender or retaliation in dealing with adversaries with ballistic missiles, rockets, whether they're short, medium, or long range. And that, he said, is the sole objective of missile defense. Finally, if you read the Wall Street Journal just yesterday, in their discussion of the negotiations that are on again and off again in North and South Korea, as well as the Chinese comments on this. It was very interesting that the writer said that the reason North Korea has nuclear weapons is to deter the United States. This is a way in which the, our dear friends in the journalism have so gotten the argument backwards. It's as if North Korea is the put-upon country and we're the bad guys. I remember I asked the head of the Union Concerned Scientists who had used that same formulation with respect to China, that China's nuclear weapons were to deter America. And I said, deter to do what? And he said, Taiwan. This is what Uzi Rubin calls fortune cookie analysis. And I said, what do you mean Taiwan? Well, we'll come to the defense of Taiwan and China wants to deter us from doing that. And I said, oh. Missile defense deters China from attacking Taiwan, right? Yes, but you don't think it's worth the candle because China might use nuclear weapons, particularly 
as it was recently pointed out by Bill Keller of the New York Times, what if we didn't have missile defense, then we wouldn't go to the defense of Taiwan, and then everything would be happy because we wouldn't be involved. So we tend to get this argument backwards, that our missile defenses are designed to protect our friends and allies from being attacked. The adversaries turn it around and make it look as if our missile defense, in the wonderful words of uh, one of our friends, Joe Cirincioni, that first the shield, then the sword, that missile defense is actually an offensive capability. So with those comments, I would like to first start with our colleague from the Ameri uh, Army War College, who would like to speak to us today about the Army's role in missile defense from his perch there at the War College. And John, would you come up here and start the uh, dialogue? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the introduction. I'm actually going to remain seated. Uh, first, I want to thank the ROA for hosting us here today. I also want to thank um, my co-panelists, Jim Thomas from the CSBA and Steve Pfeiffer from Brookings for, for joining uh, us here today. My intent was to roll out a co-authored monograph entitled NATO Missile Defense and EPAA, the Implications of Burden Sharing and the Underappreciated Role of the U.S. Army. I'm still going to talk to you about that, but the reason why you don't see stacks of that monograph sitting in the back available for you to pick up is because I learned last week from our publisher it'll be delayed by a few weeks. So stay tuned. Uh, check out the SSI, the Strategic Studies Institute at the U.S. Army War College, the SSI's webpage, or uh, follow us on Twitter, and, uh, and you'll get the latest. Uh, thank you all for joining us here today, and thanks also to our uh, Internet audience for tuning in. Uh, what I want to describe to you, for you today is the analysis that myself and my co-author, Steve Whitmore, uh, completed just a few months ago. Uh, Steve cannot be here today. He is a uh, acquisition project director at the Army's a uh, Aviation and Missile Research Development and Engineering Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Steve and I collaborated for four months last summer and fall on a project uh, to examine the role of the Army in NATO missile defense, since it seemed to us that that role was largely underappreciated and likely to grow. So what I want to do first is provide a little bit of background, uh, describe what allied contributions to NATO missile defense have been to date, and then explain where the U.S. Army fits into all of this. Now, in a major announcement in 2012 at the, NATO, at the NATO Chicago summit, the alliance announced it had an interim capability uh, to uh, protect European populations and territory from limited ballistic missile attack. Just two years prior at the 2010 summit in Lisbon, the, alignment, the alliance made the decision there to expand what had been a very limited ballistic missile defense program focused primarily on deployed forces to all of the alliance's European territory and populations. And at that Lisbon summit, the alliance also decided to accept the U.S. proposal to include the European Phased Adaptive Approach, or EPAA. You hear me use that acronym a lot. To include EPAA as part of the NATO ballistic missile defense system. Now, the Alliance's decision in 2010 to go beyond the protection of deployed forces was a major uh, change for the Alliance. Uh, technical hurdles, uh, budgetary belt tightening, and a lack of unambiguous public support for ballistic missile defense all added up to uh, what was, to many observers, a surprise decision. Not a surprise, maybe that's too strong of a phrase, but certainly a big change from what had existed just a few years prior. And yet the Alliance marched on anyway. So why did they agree? Well, there were really four reasons for this. Uh, first, there was a partial softening of European objections to ballistic missile defense. Uh, we're not yet at the point where we can say there's full, strong support for this across the entire continent, but there's been a weakening of, uh, of the opposition to this in Europe over the last couple of years. Second, and perhaps most importantly, was the American offer of EPAA to cash-strapped uh, governments in Europe the offer of the EPAA to comprise what was termed the lion's share of the NATO ballistic missile defense system was really one that was too good to turn down. And then third, when viewed from the European perspective, for a relatively small collective cost, 200 million euros spread out over 10 years from the NATO common budget, and little in the way of uh, requirements, national requirements on the part of the European allies, all of those allies got a seat at the BMD, Ballistic Missile Defense Table within NATO. 
Under the Bush administration's plan for a third site, you may recall, uh, the U.S. was set to negotiate bilateral arrangements with Poland and the Czech Republic. Under EPAA, now within the NATO architecture, uh, that was more of a collective approach, and all of the allies now had a seat at the table. And then finally, for many of the allies, even though there remain holes in the coverage in NATO's system, some ballistic missile defense is better than none at all. Uh, and the view is that at least a limited program, a limited effort, provides at least some deterrent benefit. So what have the contributions been to date? What have the allies ponied up? Some members have made pretty significant contributions. Uh, the standouts include Germany, Poland, Romania, Turkey, and Spain, which have all offered facilities or land, basing rights uh, for the U.S. or for other allied elements of this system. However, American officials recognized quite early that if they didn't push the Europeans to uh, contribute tangible assets, and by this I really mean sensors and shooters, that uh, it was likely to be just a U.S. system. And so well before the 2012 announcement, uh, the U.S. had been pushing its allies to offer these tangible kinds of commitments or assets. The problem has been that really only two allies have done that, namely Germany and the Netherlands, have offered concrete assets, specifically patriots. Overall, the lack of allied upper-tier systems, specifically shooters, uh, lack of contributions to date, reflects the fact that those systems just don't exist in our allies' inventories today, or they're still on the drawing boards. Several allies have expressed interest in uh, providing sensors and shooters. Much of that remains on, uh, uh, in the developmental stage. Now, despite those intentions, though, there are serious questions about whether or not the European allies have the wherewithal to really make those future investments. Uh, particularly in light of the budgetary situations facing their defense establishments. So now, where does the Army fit into this? When most people think about the role of the services in missile defense, they think of the Air Force and the Navy, quite naturally. The Army is usually an afterthought when it comes to this. In fact, uh, even within the Army, sometimes missile defense is kind of an afterthought. Nevertheless, the Army plays a critical role in NATO missile defense in two ways. The first is in operating the high-powered AN-2 radar, this X-band radar in Turkey. And the second is uh, one that doesn't get a lot of attention but is nonetheless vital, and that's providing what we call Title 10 support throughout the European theater to all of the military services performing this and other missions. Now let's talk about the site in Turkey first. Uh, the Kurasek site in Turkey uh, is a a military site there in that country. It had been abandoned by the Turkish military 10 years prior. Okay, so you, as you can imagine, much of the infrastructure there was completely non-functional. The army's begun to make it workable and livable after spending the first winter there in tents on a hilltop. But even today, the army has to truck water up what is a, a, a treacherous, uh, mountainous route that has to be cleared of snow daily during the winter. Additionally, there are a few signs the Turkish government is going to uh, improve the electrical lines heading up to that site, which are today inadequate to uh, feed the large power demands of this, um, this X-band radar. As a result, the Army has to truck up generator fuel on a regular basis. Now, in addition to operating that site, the Army, as I mentioned, also provides Total 10 support in the theater. This includes things like conventional ammunition, military immunization, mortuary affairs, postal services, customs inspections, and some other services. So uh, even if the Navy, for example, operates the planned Aegis Ashore sites in Romania and Poland, which is, again, the current plan, the Army will still retain responsibility with regard to some base operations and security there. So what are the implications, now that you understand a bit more about what the Army's role is in the theater, what are the implications for the Army? Um, if the optimistic expectations for European contributions to NATO's program do not come to fruition, there's reason to expect the U.S. will continue to carry most, if not all, the burden in NATO missile defense. If we take the opposite view, even if the Europeans contribute all that they have committed to to date, uh, there's still the possibility, quite likely in fact, that the U.S. will likely want to maintain the ability to surge forward additional forces uh, in the event of a crisis. This could have significant implications for the Army in terms of materiel, personnel, training, budgets, and operations. And let me run down each of those real quick for you. In terms of materiel, DOD is currently planning on acquiring 11 AN-2 radar systems at a cost of about $200 million each. 
Now, six of those are designated for use in THAAD batteries, leaving five radars to be used in what we call the forward-based mode, that is, deployed forward but without missiles attached to them, as in the THAAD system. Of those five forward-based AN-2 radars, three are currently operating around the world, one in Israel, one in northern Japan, and one today in Turkey. A fourth is reportedly headed to Qatar, and a fifth is likely destined to southern Japan. Yet another has been discussed for Asia, probably in the Philippines, and there's already evidence that another Europe-based ANTP-2 radar may be required for effective coverage of NATO's member state territory. This will be especially so if the Europeans, uh, if the central contributions on the part of the Europeans do not materialize. And then finally, of course, we need an ANTP-2 radar system for training purposes back here in the States or to provide some minimal backup capability if one of the forward deployed systems breaks or needs repair in some way. It's highly likely that for those systems, uh, the Army and not MDA will have to fund, um, put up the funding for those purchases. Now, what about in terms of personnel? What are the implications? Well, given the likelihood that additional U.S. radar systems will be necessary in Europe and the possibility that additional THAAD batteries may be deployed in the event of a crisis, the Army faces a potential manpower management challenge. This will be compounded by the plan to replace the vast majority of contractor operator maintainers of those radar systems with soldiers between 2014 and 2016, not to mention the Army's plan to downsize its own end strength. With increased manpower demands, of, cor of course, come increased training demands. The Army is planning on acquiring training devices and simulations tools, but with so few actual radars and most of them actually deployed, the Army is probably going to face some difficulty in, in training its soldiers for this mission, or at least some challenges. At a more strategic level, missile defense is not yet part of the curriculum at the Air War College, the Army War College, or in the Army's leadership schools. In terms of operations, it's quite likely that the Army's involvement will grow from an operational perspective. Part of this growth may come from the deployment of an additional ANTP-2 radar in Europe. Part may also, though, come from the need to augment the planned Aegis, Aegis Ashore sites in Poland and Romania with point defense systems, like the Patriot units, or to base a THAAD battery in Europe for the, uh, in the event of a crisis there or for deployment elsewhere. Of course, increased op tempo or operational tempo, new training mechanisms, more manpower, and additional hardware all add up to increased budgetary requirements. Unfortunately, though, the budgetary picture as it exists today, even without these additional potential requirements, is really kind of murky. Uh, as yet, we do not have a life cycle cost estimate for all of the elements of EPAA and NATO missile defense. MDAA, MDA is currently developing that, primarily at the, um, uh, in the response to a GAO recommendation. Now, mitigating the negative repercussions of these additional costs will require a detailed, all-encompassing planning efforts. Now, the Army has some of that in place today, but it's not clear whether this all-encompassing approach is there yet. So in conclusion, although the EPAA comprises an important element in America's security commitment to Europe, and although European security remains vital to U.S. national interests, it's equally clear that the potential for inequitable burden sharing in ballistic missile defense in Europe is great. Hence, it seems to us that BMD, ballistic missile defense, is likely to become a potential or a perennial irritant in transatlantic relations. Thanks for your attention. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jim Thomas from the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. And uh, let me just start by uh, thanking uh, the Strategic Studies Institute at the Army War College and the Reserve Officers Association uh, for their invitation to be here today and to join uh, my, my co-panelists, uh, Dr. John Denny and um, Ambassador Steve Pfeiffer, uh, and our moderator, uh, Mr. Peter Hussey. Um, I'm going to try to complement uh, John's remarks this morning um, as he talked uh, in particular about uh, where the Army could be going in, in ballistic missile defense uh, uh, sp specifically. I thought I might try to talk a little bit about um, future roles and missions uh, and, and where the Army might be going uh, more broadly uh, to provide context and, and how we might think about uh, uh, potential new roles and, and a greater emphasis on ballistic missile defense for the Army in the future uh, and other complementary steps that might be taken. 
I've got uh, two slides uh, to, to uh, inflict on everyone this morning. Um, if I could go to the first slide, please. Th there we go. Um, I think everyone in this room probably is well aware of, of efforts that have been underway uh, across the Department of Defense and emphasized in the, in the 2012 Defense Strategic Guidance to place greater emphasis on a so-called indirect approach. Uh, how we think about building partner capacity uh, and working by, with, and, and, and through uh, allies and partners uh, around the world. Uh, to try to uh, reduce security deficits and improve uh, regional security balances. I, I think that this is, is one key trend that's going to affect uh, the future of the Army, uh, as, well as, the, as well as its sister services, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marine Corps, even the Coast Guard. Um, I think it's uh, the second trend, which is, is perhaps less appreciated, and that is that uh, domain control, the ability to do sea control, the ability to do air control, the ability to do land control, uh, space and cyber, uh, is, is rapidly eroding um, given the, the proliferation of uh, precision guided uh, weapon systems around the world. Um, it just is, is getting to a point where it's, it's very difficult for us to exercise sea control within the range of an anti-ship ballistic missile or anti-ship cruise missiles. It's getting more and more difficult to exercise uh, air control and, and establish air superiority in areas where uh, sophisticated air defense systems uh, reside. And similarly, it's getting very difficult, it's getting more difficult to establish land control, especially in an expeditionary fashion, uh, doing that at, 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 uh, at, at, at intercontinental ranges where we're deploying f uh, forces from the continental United States, uh, either to, uh, to the Middle East or to Europe or, or to Asia. Um, given the increasing vulnerabilities of the ports and airfields through which those forces uh, have, have to enter the theater, uh, and their vulnerability uh, at any time that they're masked. So this slide here is really just to say that um, I, I think that there's uh, a shift that's underway from the current emphasis uh, of, of the U.S. Army, which really since uh, World War II and arguably World War I has really been on uh, the direct use of U.S. forces uh, for achieving land control towards these new areas. Um, and, and what I've argued in a, in a recent Foreign Affairs article is that I think the Army has, uh, in addition to a role in building partner capacity, uh, you can think of that as the, the indirect land control, uh, how we work with our partners so that they can better uh, and more effectively police themselves and establish uh, 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 security conditions within their own borders. Um, but also, how do we think about the role that the U.S. Army can play in a more asymmetric fashion, uh, creating uh, conditions of air and sea denial in particular for potential adversaries that are out there in regional environments, as well as in, in this lower southeast quadrant, how the Army might help our allies actually to uh, develop friendly anti-access and area denial capabilities, just as uh, our, our potential adversaries are acquiring uh, precision-guided weapons. Uh, would it actually make sense for some of our allies in some cases to also be acquiring these similar systems uh, to be able to better defend their sovereignty? Next slide, please. So here, here what I was trying to do is just kind of outline where, um, what, what is the mission set or what are the, what's the range of operations that the Army is going to undertake uh, in, in, in future years? Um, and and the, the, the big uh, planetary-like uh, uh, circles there are really just to kind of give you some sense of, uh, in, a, in a qualitative fashion, um, what, what, the, what the current emphasis is within the Army. Um, that today's Army really is focused on direct land control, that category in the middle, uh, combined arms maneuver uh, through expeditionary warfare, uh, and, and obviously from our experience of the past uh, 10 years, heavily focused in, in conducting counterinsurgency operations. But I would also lump homeland defense and consequence management in here. Yeah, even if you were to conduct operations at home, uh, the Army would, would largely be in the business of direct land control, uh, perimeter security and, and site security and the like. But 
my argument would be that um, these these other categories uh, to the left and the right of, of of that very large direct land control category, these these already exist within the army today, and these are really the orphans. Uh, it's it's uh, air defense artillery, uh, it's it's uh, Attackums and HIMARS batteries. Uh, it's, it's special operations forces and, and security force assistance forces and FAOs and things like that. Uh, but both to the left and right, these orphan capabilities within the Army are increasingly going to be more important in the Army's future. And, and I think it's better appreciated on the, uh, the left-hand side in terms of thinking about what I call pulsed uh, point control. And you can think of this as uh, special mission units and rangers conducting, conducting direct action missions. Um, but I would also include here uh, more unconventional uses of armored forces uh, for essentially flushing out uh, uh, dug-in uh, or concealed land forces uh, so that those targets can be serviced from the air. I think this is really one of the key lessons from the 2006 Israeli Hezbollah war in the Latani Valley. Uh, was it was the lack of of this air ground integration, uh, which which led to uh, the difficulties that the Israeli Defense Force in part had um, dealing dealing with Hezbollah, um, and that here if you had the ability using a cavalry like uh, armored force to rapidly penetrate into an enemy area uh, and smoke out uh, and uh, 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 dug in land forces, uh, these could be better serviced uh, from from the air. And I would also include things like WMD elimination, uh, and I think this is timely as we think about Syria today uh, in terms of how we might have to use uh, land forces to go in and secure key site facilities where there are chemical weapons caches. And in the future, you would think about the same thing for uh, other forms of WMD elimination, even render safe. The, the next category over is, is this idea of indirect land control. And as I mentioned, um, I think that this is a real tension that we, we want to stay, the U.S. Army wants to stay in the land control business. And I, and I think this makes sense, but we're going to have to do it differently. Uh, and, and rather than doing it through uh, the occupation of countries and, and counterinsurgencies, um, we're going to have to take a more indirect approach and we're going to have to be in the business using security force assistance and foreign internal defense as well as unconventional warfare where we want to do this potentially in a hostile country. Uh, we're going to have to work more, uh, uh, more closely with our, with our allies and partners including non-state actors uh, to achieve uh, land control. That isn't to say we're going to get out of the direct control, land control business entirely. Um, I, I think that it's just a question of where we're placing our emphasis in the future. Uh, and here, I think we're going to maintain capabilities, including heavy, heavy armored forces for combined, uh, for combined arms maneuver. Um, and we, we don't want to forget the lessons of the past decade uh, in, in terms of counterinsurgency. <clears throat> but I think that these capabilities may have uh, perhaps less emphasis as we look out over the next several decades. So this brings me to the right-hand side of, of, of the slide and, and thinking about both air and sea denial as well as land denial. Uh, and here, I think these are real growth opportunities for the, for the U.S. Army. Um, it, it already is in the air defense and missile defense business, uh, but, but I think um, we're going to have to look at, at how we move beyond the era of that and Patriot. Uh, and we think uh, about um, the, the promise of directed energy weapon systems for, for air and missile defense, as well as railgun technology and other capabilities. Um, but it's, it's maybe a, a different pattern of operations than what we've experienced most recently. It may be less about deploying Patriot and Thad in a crisis into, a, into an ally or a partner country to defend. Um, and instead, we may be talking uh, about going back to the future, back to an era before World War II where we actually had permanently stationed or garrisoned forces in some of these places where we start to replicate steps that our, um, that our adversaries are taking, our potential adversaries are taking around the world where we have deep underground facilities, hardened facilities. Um, but in particular, I think the Army can play a critical role and essentially uh, establishing security bubbles through air and, and missile defense, as well as uh, anti-ship cruise missiles for coastal defense around critical port and, and air ports and airfields, uh, enabling the rest of the joint force uh, to, to be able to, uh, to insert and stage uh, at, the, at those facilities in a crisis. In particular, this would require uh, the Army resurrecting the old coastal defense mission. Um, this is a mission uh, which uh, continued up uh, until uh, shortly after World War II, 
And then coastal defense artillery were, were disestablished within the U.S. Army. Um, right now, this is a growth area for a number of allies around the world, uh, and, and probably most particularly uh, Japan has been placing greater and greater emphasis on its uh, uh, anti-ship cruise missile forces. These are shore-based forces uh, that can conduct uh, sea denial. And the reality is they can do it at, at, at um, far uh, lower cost than the naval forces performing the same mission. Again, I think there's a real strength in thinking asymmetrically about how we use land forces to uh, do air and sea denial and how we can use air forces uh, perhaps for doing, uh, playing a greater role than land denial in the future. We don't have to think in terms of, of tanks interdicting tanks. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can think about this problem differently. Um, but I think the flip side of that, as Peter mentioned uh, in, in his opening remarks, is how we complement the defensive capability with, with some offensive strike capability. And um, since 1987 and the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, um, the, the Army has gotten out of the, uh, the, the business of, uh, of maintaining uh, uh, intermediate range ballistic missiles, that is, you know, those between 500 and 500 and, uh, 5,500 kilometers uh, range. Um, this was a good treaty, and it made sense at the time. And, and a, perhaps it could still be a good treaty, but we have a number of, um, of uh, countries out there, and most prominently China, that fall outside of this, of this treaty regime. And, and so I think it, it, it really leads us to say we want either other countries to accede to the treaty, uh, and we want to expand uh, the, the number of countries that are in, within the treaty regime, or, or perhaps we need to rethink and, and say and reevaluate and say maybe the time has come uh, where uh, uh, with with Russia we would want to think about uh, allowing the treaty to lapse or withdrawing from it, um, uh, so that these are capabilities that we might also pursue. And, and I think we'd want to do it for a couple reasons. Um, one is that. Uh, Complementing missile defense uh, is the ability to do missile suppression. Um, how do we think in the future about using our land-based forces uh, to hold at risk uh, both the, uh, the communications command and control as well as the uh, intelligence uh, and surveillance and reconnaissance sensors uh, of a potential adversary? Um, many of those are fixed sites, and they really lend themselves to, to standoff weapon systems, uh, ballistic or cruise missile systems. Um, the, the other is actually the, the potential interdiction of, uh, of launchers themselves, uh, and, and that could be through a combination of, uh, of uh, loitering munitions coupled with either uh, b ballistic or cruise uh, delivery systems. And, and the last is thinking about uh, future longer range counter battery fire uh, and, and how that's conducted. Uh, again, um, uh, the counter force uh, complement to, to steps that we would take with our missile defenses. Let, let me just wrap up by um, underscoring a point that, that John made earlier in terms of our, our budgetary situation. Um, yes, we have a fiscal imperative to change uh, uh, the, 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 the composition uh, and, and the capabilities and force mix of each of the, of the military services. Uh, but this is only one imperative. I think the other, which is uh, equally important, is thinking about how we adapt our forces to changing operating environments. And here, across the board, for all of our services, uh, we face operating environments that are going to be far more contested, far less permissive in the future than they have in the recent past. Uh, and, and so there is uh, both the challenge of adjusting to more austere fiscal times, coupled with the opportunity of, of resetting our forces in ways uh, where they maintain their viability for projecting power uh, at extended ranges in the future. And I think here the Army um, has uh, resident within it already the, the key building blocks that are needed for doing this uh, <clears throat> in, in areas like air and missile defense. Uh, but these, have to, these are going to be expanded, and I think that there's uh, greater emphasis that will needs to be placed on them as we look to the future. Thank you. Okay, well, let me also thank uh, John for inviting me to take part in the panel, and also thanks to the Reserve Office Association for providing uh, the venue today. Um, John suggests that I talk, uh, kind of take step back and take a broader view of U.S. policy, uh, how the Europeans look at this. Uh, the Russian approach and possibilities for NATO-Russia cooperation in the missile defense area. 
And so with apologies to our moderator and his uh, uh, proposal that we not be Russia-centric, it's, it's sort of hard to do given the task I was laid. Uh, but let me start with American policy on missile defense and, and begin really uh, in terms of homeland defense, it goes back to I think the early 1990s, which is a policy that says uh, the United States should seek to have the capability to defend the United States against uh, limited ballistic missile attack. Uh, normally put in terms of dealing with a rogue state such as a future Iranian uh, or North Korean intercontinental ballistic missile. Now that policy has consistently over the last 20 years ruled out the idea of trying to defend the United States against a Russian attack. Uh, simply, I think, recognition that the resources that we have for missile defense and the technologies uh, would not uh, provide the capability to deal with a Russian attack. Uh, there is interesting, I think, with regards to China, a much more uh, ambiguous position. If you look at the Missile Defense Posture Report of 2012, uh, there is ambiguity there as to whether or not it's official U.S. policy to defend against China or not. Uh, and I think that ambiguity uh, and that language was chosen very careful to be ambiguous. But that is the policy. Uh, in terms of the systems we look at, uh, there are now 26 ground-based interceptors uh, deployed at Fort Greeley, Alaska, and four additional uh, at Andrew Air Force Base in California designed to do mid-course intercept. Uh, and as of March, the plan is to install an additional 14 interceptors in, at Fort Greeley by 2017 once they work out some of the technical issues with the ground-based interceptors that I think have caused some questions about the effectiveness of those missiles. Uh, but the bigger focus in the last several years and in the missile defense area has been on the European phase adaptive approach, which uh, John described in part. And the idea here basically was to take the standard SM-3 missile interceptor and upgrade its capabilities in anticipation that Iran uh, would, expand, would acquire longer and longer range ballistic missiles. So phase one, which is actually, as John said, uh, achieved in... Um, interim operating capability in 2011 is based on the deployment of the, AT, the ANTPY-2 um, radar in Turkey. And then there are U.S. naval warships in the vicinity of, uh, of uh, NATO uh, Europe which have SM-3 interceptors that could deal with short and medium range Iranian missiles and those could be chopped to uh, NATO control uh, if necessary. Uh, phase two of the plan, uh, which is designed to be achieved in 2015, will take uh, the SM-3 uh, Block 1B missile, which is supposed to have a, a better guidance system, uh, and that will actually deploy a capability ashore uh, in Romania, 24 interceptors managed by a, a small American military detachment there. Uh, phase three would then take the SM-3 Block 2A, which is to have a capability to deal with intermediate as well as short and medium range ballistic missiles and would deploy 24 of those interceptors in 2018 in Poland. Now, phase four was the proposal to give the SM-3 uh, a capability to engage an intercontinental ballistic missile warhead. Uh, the Secretary of Defense announced in March that that had been canceled. Uh, and, and basically, because of technical and cost considerations, uh, they seem to be have a problem developing an SM-3 that could engage an ICBM that would have sufficient range and velocity and meet the requirements when basically the Navy requirement is that that missile has to have a diameter of 21 inches to be compatible with the Navy's vertical launch system. And uh, as they looked at the SM-3 uh, Block 2B in Phase 4, uh, it looked like they would need something with 27 inches diameter, which would have been a significant issue for uh, Navy vessels. So that's where the U.S. is in terms of the ground-based interceptors and the European phased adaptive approach. I'd add just a couple of comments to uh, what, uh, what John had to say regarding uh, European views. And as he mentioned, in, in, in 2010, uh, the uh, NATO summit at Lisbon endorsed the idea of NATO taking on the mission of defending populations in European territory against ballistic missile attack. Uh, but I, I, I do wonder, I'm not sure that there's a lot of concern uh, in Europe at this point demonstrated by the European commitment of capabilities. Uh, I'm not sure there's a lot of ca uh, concern about outside ballistic missile attack. I, I don't believe that there are a lot of officials who lay, away, uh, lay awake late at night worrying about an Iranian ballistic missile. The plan so far has been acceptable because the United States has been prepared to provide the bulk of the systems, the bulk of the funding. Uh, but when you look at the European contribution, which is about 200 million euros over 10 years to provide the command and control system that will ap apply for NATO missile defense, and then some contributions by Germany and the Netherlands of Patriot systems, which they've already purchased, 
there does not seem to be a surge of European interest in developing new missile defense capabilities. Now, I do think that there, are, there is interest in having uh, the U.S. presence there, uh, and I'd give a couple of reasons beyond those that John cited. I think in Central Europe, uh, particularly in Romania and Poland, there is an interest in missile defense, not so much out of a fear of Iranian ballistic missile attack, but because of the assurance that having American military detachments on their territory provides. Uh, and, and I know there's somebody here from the Polish Embassy who can correct me on this, but I suspect that it's a much a matter of having an American presence there, and it relates less to the question whether it's an SM3 or a Patriot, but there's an additional signal of American uh, commitment to, to their security. Uh, I think for other members of the alliance, uh, maybe countries such as Germany and, and Holland, uh, there is interest in missile defense out of a belief that deploying missile defenses in Europe may be able to take on some of the deterrence and assurance burden that is now borne by nuclear weapons and that is, I think, compatible with the desire in some of those countries to see the American nuclear posture in uh, the nuclear posture in Europe be reduced. Uh, let me now turn to the Russian position, and I think any discussion of where the Russians are has to begin with a point that the Russians very rarely uh, make, which is that the Russians have a very active missile defense effort. Uh, there is still a, an anti-ballistic missile system operating around Moscow with 68 interceptors. Uh, the Russians talk about building the S-400 and the S-500 systems, which not only will have air defense capabilities, but also they say will have capabilities against ballistic, missile, uh, ballistic missiles. Um, I find it interesting that um, I, I think the, uh, a week or two ago when he was testifying, General Kaler was asked about his concern, and uh, he seemed to be relatively relaxed about what the S-400 and the S-500 might mean for American uh, capabilities in terms of being able to penetrate and hold at risk targets in Russia, which I suspect uh, reflects uh, an American view, and I think it's probably the more sophisticated view, that when you're talking about defense against either an American ballistic missile attack or a Russian ballistic missile attack, uh, offense still dominates over defense. But uh, in terms of the NATO-Russia angle, uh, in November 2010, at the same summit that NATO agreed to uh, take on the Alliance Ballistic Missile Defense Mission, uh, there was also a subsequent meeting with uh, Russia, then Russian President Dmitry Medvedev, at which NATO and Russia agreed to explore the possibility of a cooperative NATO-Russia missile defense system for Europe. Uh, that uh, progress on that, and I'll come back to I, I think there actually was some progress made early on, but. Progress has been held up by uh, Russian concerns. I, I think the Russian concerns can be broken down into several pieces, uh, uh, several of which I don't find valid. Um, one is that the Russians have said they are concerned about the capability of American missile defenses to engage Russian strategic forces. And, and the argument often boiled down to a focus on phase four, where they said, look, Iran does not have an ICBM, which is correct. Uh, the Russians said, we don't believe Iran is going to have an ICBM for many, many years. Uh, my guess is that the Russians would tend to underestimate Iran's capabilities in that regard. But then the conclusion that the Russians have drawn is, since it can't be against Iran, therefore it must be against us. Uh, and there was a long back and forth over the last year and a half, a battle of view graphs and PowerPoints between the Pentagon and, and the Ministry of Defense of Russia as to whether phase four uh, deploying those SM-3 missiles in Poland would be a threat to Russian strategic forces. Uh, my own view is that the Pentagon was more correct than the Russians on this, but that argument is now moot because phase four has been canceled. Uh, a second Russian concern, and I think this is primarily in the Ministry of Defense, uh, I question if the Russian Ministry of Defense, I think there are people there who really aren't that interested in cooperation. And a large part of it is that because they see value in portraying the American missile defense system as a threat to Russia, in order to be able to secure resources for their own S-400 and S-500 systems. Uh, a third reason which I think applies uh, in Moscow in terms of their opposition to the European phased adaptive approach and possible cooperation with NATO is that Moscow has not yet fully reconciled itself to the enlargement of NATO. A and so there is concern that at part, as parts of phases two and three, you would have American military infrastructure and small American military detachments being deployed on the territory of Romania and Poland. And there may still be some in Moscow who believe that uh, missile defense can be a divisive issue within the alliance, that they can stir dissent in the same way that uh, they tried back in the early 1980s with the uh, debate over intermediate range nuclear missiles in Europe. Uh, uh, my guess is that uh, if they believe that, they are uh, considerably overestimating how controversial an issue missile defense is in Europe. But what this has boiled down to is for the last two years, Russia has asked for what they call a, quote, legal guarantee 
that American missile defenses would not be directed against Russian strategic forces. And then they say that um, the legal guarantee should be accompanied by what they refer to as objective criteria, which uh, translate to limits on numbers, velocities of interceptors, and locations, and, and, and pretty much appears to be a resurrection of the anti-ballistic missile treaty from which the United States withdrew in 2002. Um, now, I, I think the Russians have a legitimate point on offense and defense. You know, if the United States increases its missile defenses significantly in number, and they increase in quality, or for that matter, if the Russians increase their missile defenses in number and quality, a at some point, that could undermine the strategic offensive balance that you have in the New START Treaty. Uh, and I could even say, except that at some point, the Russians might uh, um, ha have an argument for a legally binding treaty on missile defense. But I would argue that at this point in time, the gap between offense and defense in the strategic realm is so large, it's so huge, uh, that uh, any kind of a legal limitation on missile defenses is simply unnecessary. Uh, under New START, uh, the United States and Russia each can maintain up to 1,550 deployed strategic warheads, the bulk of which are uh, warheads on intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine launched ballistic missiles. Uh, under the uh, plan uh, uh, described by President Obama yesterday in Berlin, the United States and Russia each would have somewhat over 1,000 deployed strategic warheads. And set against that is 2017, at most on the American side, would be 44 interceptors capable of engaging a strategic ballistic missile warhead. And on the Russian side, you know, 68 uh, interceptors around Moscow, although my sense is that the U.S. military is not particularly concerned about the capabilities of those interceptors. Uh, so uh, I, I would argue that this idea of a treaty now, it's totally unnecessary. And the reality is that a legally binding treaty would never get the two-thirds majority vote it needs to be passed uh, by the U.S. Senate. A and the Russians understand this. I mean, this is not a secret to them. So the question boils down to, are the Russians prepared to do a deal on missile defense? Uh, and uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, if the Russians are prepared to do a deal, uh, I, I think you actually can see the major pieces of what a cooperative missile defense operation could look like. Uh, first of all, uh, and, and this goes back to conversations that took place between the Department of Defense and the Ministry of Defense uh, back in early 2011. Uh, interesting, there were several track two discussions. Brookings con conducted one. The more detailed one was done by the Carnegie Endowment in the U Atlantic Security Initiative. And these all came up with fairly similar ideas. Uh, you know, one idea was transparency, is that NATO and Russia would have to have a degree of transparency about their respective missile defense systems. If you're going to work in a cooperative manner, you have to know something about the capabilities of the other side. Uh, a second idea was joint exercises, NATO-Russia military exercises together in the missile defense area as a way of uh, basically getting an understanding about how your, uh, the, your partner would perform in terms of missile defense operations. And, and actually, that, that's probably not too hard to do. Uh, the United States and Russia have done missile defense exercises jointly going back to the late 1990s. Third, uh, there, there seemed to be agreement between the sides that you, when you're talking about missile defense cooperation, you are not talking about a single system. You are talking about two independent systems, a NATO system, which would control a decision to launch a NATO interceptor, and a Russian system, which would control a decision to launch a Russian interceptor. And, and the reason that you're not talking about a single system is uh, NATO's not prepared to work for a Russian general, and Russia's not prepared to work for a NATO general. Uh, and, and you have to have really independent systems in the sense that because of the short timelines that you would have, to make uh, a decision to launch an interceptor, if it's a medium-range missile coming towards Europe, probably on the order of two to six minutes, uh, there's no time for really consultation. It's going to be you know, one side making that decision. Uh, but the sides did discuss the idea that these two systems, um, a NATO and the Russian missile defense systems, could interact in, in a couple of ways uh, through jointly manned NATO-Russia centers. Now, for efficiency, you might have looked at one missile defense center. I think the idea of having two centers was that one could be based on Russian territory and one could be based on the territory of a, of a NATO state. But one idea was a data fusion center where you would take early warning and tracking data from American and NATO sensors bring it to a center and combine it with information from like sources from the Russian side, and then send that enhanced product back to both sides. And I think there would be interest uh, in both sides in, in, in having that sort of data. I, I've talked to people in the U.S. government who say in that mechanism, uh, it could give us access to Russian early warning data from the Armavir radar uh, in southern Russia, which has the best view of a radar uh, looking at Iran, uh, the, the country of greatest concern to NATO. 
Uh, the second center would be a planning and operations center, which would be a venue for the side to discuss what sort of threats they worry about. In this case, NATO would be focused on the uh, Iranian threat. What are the attack scenarios that they prepare to defend against? And then to discuss some idea of what their rules of engagement might be. So again, the other side has an understanding of how uh, its partner would react in response to a missile defense or ballistic missile attack. So I, I think that there are pieces here that if the Russians would be prepared to do a deal, um, they can come together uh, in a way that could allow for a cooperative NATO-Russia missile defense arrangement. Uh, I would argue that that would be in NATO's interest. Uh, first of all, it could enhance the defense of Europe against ballistic missile attack. Uh, second, it could remove an obstacle to further nuclear reductions. Uh, and third, it also might be a game changer in attitudes. I've, I've talked to some retired Russian generals who say if you could actually get a cooperative NATO-Russian missile defense system, we're allies in working together in a way that might affect uh, the broader stereotypes that still prevail in Moscow regarding NATO. Um, so I, I, it'll be interesting to see, I think, where this goes. You know, my sense is from uh, actually re the Russian media reported that uh, uh, the, the President Obama was prepared to offer some uh, kind of agreement on transparency, you know, not, not an agreement that we would not direct missile defenses against the other side, which is sort of a strange statement of intentions, but to provide transparency in a way that would provide the Russians assurance that they could take a look at American missile defense plans, do the calculations, and understand that those plans were not going to pose a missile defense force that, force that would be a threat to Russian strategic forces. Uh, and uh, the Russian response, uh, well, we'll have to see, at least some of the public uh, uh, expressions over the last couple of months suggest to me that the Russians have toned down their rhetoric in a way and are at least leaving the door open. Uh, I, I do not know how much missile defense was discussed when the two presidents mentioned, meant in Northern Ireland on Monday. I suspect that conversation was dominated more by problems like Syria. Uh, but I would suggest that uh, the meeting to look for is when President Obama meets with President Putin in September, where they've scheduled a full-up summit, uh, and that may be an opportunity to see whether uh, some progress on the missile defense question is indeed possible. So at this point, stop and be happy to join my panelists in taking questions. Thank you. Let me pose a question to all three of you, if I might, please. Uh, my concern about having a U.S.-Russian or NATO-Russian agreement is that if it's only dealing with ballistic missile defenses centered in NATO that can intercept a strategic Russian rocket, there are no such animals, unless you include Alaska and California, which is technically part of NATO because we're part of NATO. And the, my question is, to what extent does this interfere with the rest of what NATO does with the missile defense, which has nothing to do with Russian strategic rocket forces, but with potential threats from the Middle East and elsewhere, where or where NATO may have to be deployed, because as Fred Cap as, uh, Kaplan, uh, Fred Kaplan points out, ballistic missiles are becoming the common coin of the realm, and the inventory of such weapons is increasing in country after country of various ranges and I just get a sense that the Russians will play us for as many concessions as possible but they don't control the threat to NATO from these other countries and yet they want to control the the defense either by limiting it geographically or by it, limiting its inventory or its speed or capability so I'd like kind of three of you to address that because that, that is also a central concern of both House and Senate Armed Services Committee members. Well, I guess I'd make a couple of responses. I mean, yeah, if you assume you're going to negotiate stupid, you, you might lose. But I don't think there's anybody on the NATO side that I've heard who's talking about a cooperative NATO-Russia missile defense system resulting in any kind of limitations on the numbers of or capabilities of NATO missile defenses. Uh, the idea, I think, here is that to provide sufficient transparency about naval capabilities so that mm -hmm. Russia could look at that and say, this is not going to be a threat to our strategic forces. Uh, in terms of NATO capabilities to deal with medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles, that should not be a concern to Russia because Russia, like the United States, is banned by the INF Treaty from having ballistic missiles with a range between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. And my suspicion is that for the foreseeable future, 
uh, the number of missile defense systems that NATO has, and this is really, I think, just talking about the United States, that would have capabilities against strategic ballistic missiles is going to remain relatively limited. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the policy, as I said at the beginning, that the policy seen, uh, remains to defend against limited ballistic missile attack. And uh, again, and unless there is a technological breakthrough of some kind that allows us to change the equation, I mean, we've been trying to do missile defense on the strategic level for 40 years. Uh, and I think the conclusion still has to be that offense is going to win that, 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 that debate. Now, there may be something out in the future that would change that, but you know, right now we're still in that position. Uh, and, and again, I think it, it's a wise policy that, that the U.S. government has adopted, which is not to try to defend a, a capability against a Russian ballistic missile attack, which I think would be beyond the resources and the technologies that we have now. So uh, again, I, I think as long as NATO doesn't give away things that it doesn't have to give, but if it's talking about not limits but transparency, uh, this should not be uh, a system that would uh, constrain NATO capabilities to get, defend against the sort of threats uh, that it uh, might wish to defend against. I guess I just would add that I think both for thinking about ballistic missile defense policy as well as our uh, uh, strategic nuclear forces in the future that we're going to have to think in a, in a more global way uh, that I think for too long it's really been the, the, the Russian tail way, wagging the, the strategic stability dog. Um, and, and I think we're just we're in a new era. Uh, we're going to have to think about a wider range of, of nuclear powers and a, and a wider range of powers uh, possessing both their own uh, ballistic missile defenses as well as their own both conventional and, and nuclear uh, long-range missile forces. Thanks for the question, Peter. I think that uh, both Jim and Steve have, have got it right that there's probably a prudent way ahead here uh, in terms of maybe globalizing the issue, which is appropriate. But I, I think at a, a broader perspective, I'm just not convinced we're going to get there with the Russians. Uh, I think that uh, they've got great interest, and Steve mentioned a very good uh, reason for this, the organizational uh, politics within Russia playing a role there. I would take an even broader perspective, though, and add that uh, – it matters most to Russia, I think, to matter in the world. And so this is one issue in which they can posture themselves as a counterpart to the superpower, to the United States. I don't see them giving up on that. Um, and I, the evidence I would cite for that is how they reacted to the cancellation of Phase 4 of EPAA. I mean, that was the most offensive element of EPAA, with good reason, if the U.S. could master the technical challenges um, and achieve the, the speed of, of the, um, the 2B, SM3, uh, Block 2B, uh, and yet the Russians decided that wasn't good enough. So I just don't see there being an agreement to worry about, frankly. Let me um, one comment about what Steve said is that we really have had an unfettered capability of building national missile defense, if that's what we want to call it, since the ABM Treaty went away, which is less well about a decade ago. Uh, even though we did draw on an awful lot of work that we've done since not only the SDIO speech of the presidents in March of 1983, but the previous work. Um, in following up what both John, Jim, and, and Steve have said is that a concern I hear from our colleagues on Capitol Hill is that, as I said, if you give the Russians reason to believe that you will make concessions to them to get their assistance on, let's say, strategic nuclear weapons cuts, uh, they will take that in earnest, and they will add to the number of concessions they would like, because they you know they know that you're in the mood. Um, if a farmer thinks by giving away his sheep, the wolves won't come down to get the cattle, it doesn't work that way. And uh, the Russians are very good negotiators, and I I personally think that uh, this is none of the Russians' business, particularly in that they are the ones and their Chinese friends helping develop the threat over which they aren't telling us that, well, you limit your NMD and we'll limit the guys who are aiming rockets at you. They're actually in the business of, along with some of their other allies, of expanding that threat. And I think we get in this game of giving the Russians far too much leverage against a system that, yes, it's not going to shoot down 1,000 Russian warheads or 1,500 Russian warheads. But if 20 Chinese warheads are coming at us, I don't think the President of the United States is going to say, God, the law says it's limited, and 
I guess we can't shoot it down. Or previously, I remember when we were talking about Alps and G-PALS, Malcolm Wallop said that, well, if it's an accidental launch, you can shoot it down, but if it's deliberate, you got to let it go. I think missile defense should be looked at as any other military capability. If it's necessary and we can do it and we have the resources and it promotes stability, we should do it. Just to come back, Peter, again, I, I think, um, yeah, you, th th this is up to ourselves. I think we can have the discussion on transparency, and I think in, in, in case of a lot of the transparency that you might provide, the Russians could actually get themselves through looking at congressional budget documents. Uh, but my assumption is that we are smart enough, you know, to set a line and, and, and go across it. You know, if you assume that we're going to go in with concession after concession, I can share your concern, but, but, but I assume that we would be uh, smart enough to draw the line. Questions? Wait for the mic. Oh. Let us know who you are, please. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm still Joseph Wolfsheimer, and this microphone is working. Uh, two questions. One concerning the uh, installation in uh, several of the countries. John, I think it was, mentioned that the Army will be replacing contractors with soldiers. I recall there was some discussion with the lawyers. You have mentioned uh, logistical support, mortuary support, but you forgot the lawyers. Uh, there have been, there were some discussions with the nations in which we wanted to set up capabilities concerning the status of forces and tax exemptions and whether contractors were eligible for them. It, so my qu first question is whether the need to replace uh, contractors with soldiers has anything to do with that or, and how you see the, pro the program of manning going forward. Uh, secondly, didn't in the 80s uh, we have a NATO common funded patriot program with headquarters in Capellan, Luxembourg? Uh, I, I don't see, I, as you're suggesting, we won't, probably won't have a return to that. Instead, you're saying that allies will take on minimal roles with the exception of Germany and the Netherlands, which have patriot programs. Uh, of course, all these nations don't necessarily have all the capabilities that the U.S. has. The Netherlands does has the DCA nuclear role, they do Patriots. Belgium does the DCA nuclear role, and they do naval mining. Czech Republic has a CBRN defense battalion. Each nation has a specialty. What roles do you think that uh, allies, either specific ones or through uh, common participation, could uh, take up as we move forward? Thank you. Sure, Joseph, thanks for your question. Uh, first, the need to replace contractors with a plan to replace contractors. Really, that's site-specific, and I'm talking about here the, uh, the ANTP2 radar sites. And a lot of that depends upon the desires, the wishes of the uh, hosting country. Uh, in this case, in Turkey, uh, you know, as you know, we do have a sofa with Turkey, and so uh, there are arrangements, legal arrangements already in place uh, for that to occur for the protection of our soldiers. Um, I can contrast that, for example, with um, the site in Japan, the existing site right now in northern Japan, where, um, uh, or in southern Japan, excuse me, where there's uh, not a large soldier presence at all, and it's likely to stay that way. But in Turkey, the plan is to, to shift this over, and I don't see there being a lot of legal impediments in the way of doing that. Uh, with regard to your question about the role the allies could play, several of them have stated rather explicitly what they hope uh, to do. And I'm thinking specifically of uh, the French, the Italians, the Norwegians, uh, the Brits, all of these countries have plans to either upgrade systems or acquire new systems and in some way then contribute to NATO ballistic missile defense. Most of them are interested in contributing sensors, not shooters. Uh, regardless, as I mentioned in my presentation, it's not clear to me whether they'll have the wherewithal to, uh, to really follow through on that. Uh, in the case of the Dutch, they are right now upgrading some of their radars on, uh, on four of their frigates. That's money that's already been obligated. They're actually doing the work now. But in these other cases that I've mentioned, uh, a lot of that is just aspirational or it's often um, in future budgets, and it really remains to be seen. What will remain lacking, I think, is a lot of allied, European allied contributions in terms of upper tier shooters. And there, I think I see the Americans carrying the bulk of the, of the load going forward. Uh, 
This is Sidney Friedberg from Breaking Defense News. This is primarily a question from Mr. Thomas, but has uh, proliferation ramifications that might be uh, relevant to the whole panel. You know, understood that the Army has its has, has its focus, but you know, I remember actually Andy Kripinevich talking about Army needing uh, missile offense uh, brigades back in 1999, I think. I mean, does the U.S. need more? strike capabilities at this point uh, to, you know, it seems like that's the one thing across the joint world we have in abundance. Uh, and, you know, it seems there's also the secondary concern that if the Army starts shooting ballistic missiles at people with conventional warheads, uh, they might get a little worried the warheads are nuclear and uh, launch a counter strike uh, on us with their nukes, uh, especially if you start, you know, hitting, you know, C4 ISR sites in mainland China and blind their capability to figure out what you are doing. So, you know, why is the Army need to be in this business and how do you deal with the proliferation or the, uh, the escalation ramifications? Well, <clears throat> I, I think they're good questions. Uh, um, to, to the first, uh, well, how much offensive strike capability do we really have in operating in denied environments? Uh, you've got 20 B2s and, and, and their loadouts. Um, and uh, that's, um, and then you have um, some standoff capability uh, in, in terms of uh, TLAMs and the like. But but I would argue that it's rather limited, and also is is geographically constrained. I mean, you're you're really limited to, um, uh, in in the case of TLAMs, to systems at about 1,200 nautical miles, um, and and you're limited. Um, you're, you're going to be limited more in terms of capacity and what can be air delivered. Uh, and into denied environments. Um, so, so th the argument is is that if, as you look at where uh, the PLA has gone with the development of the second artillery force and and uh, you know significant buildup in its uh, theater ballistic missiles and in particular um, you know growing MRBM and IRBM capabilities. Um, how do you offset that? And you know, to date, we've been uh, focused on offsetting that through uh, defensive capabilities. And the problem is just the cost exchange ratios. That until you know, as, as, as Steve was saying, until there's some new technological advance, whether that's in directed energy or uh, railgun technology or some other uh, other area of advancement in missile defenses, um, offense tends to win, but offense is also cheaper. And so. Um, how do we think about perhaps a, a different mix of systems in the future, uh, which which mix both offensive and defensive systems for deterrence? And in terms of the the escalation issues, I, I think that they're serious. Um, you know, obviously, you know, you you run that risk anytime uh, you're you're attacking a command and control system or you're conducting attacks on on someone's home homeland, but. But I'm also concerned about the, the idea for, for um, some potential adversaries of um, the United States just adopting a policy where we rule out the possibility uh, that we'll strike the mainland or we'll strike their homeland or we'll conduct strikes against their C2. Um, be, because you're, you, you know, you're just making the problem easy for them. Um, so you know, I, I, think there's a, I think there is some distinction between how you deter and, and how you fight. And I don't think, you know, just as with the use of nuclear weapons you know, and, and the administration's uh, policy, the, these are things we use in very extreme cases. Uh, and you know, you're, you're not going to do this lightly. But, but I think that um, there is a role for improving uh, conventional deterrence. Uh, and, and this may be one element in doing that. Let me uh, briefly answer, give a comment on that. I remember years ago, General Chain, when he was SAC commander, said that you know he grew up as a counter-battery fire specialist. Defense is not just defense. You don't just sit there and say, well, you got any more? Because you can go after where they're shooting from. And I think Jim's right, you need that capability. Also, I'd point out that Look what happened in Israel with Hamas, and it wasn't just Hamas. Hamas was getting its rockets from Iran, and in part it was being shipped through the Sudan across the Sinai with kind of a wink-wink from the Egyptians. So this was not just a terror group versus Israel. This was more than that, what Mike Ledeen would call the terror masters. And the offense didn't win. In fact, the tape recordings of the words of the Hamas operatives 
uh, were filled with um, swear word deleted, where they were getting angry at the proof, the uh, at how good the Jews were, as they said on these tapes, about where'd they come up with this idea. Uh, the Israelis modified the Iron Dome in the midst of using it. Literally changed the software while they were in the midst of defending against these rockets. And then Hamas was forced to go to their Egyptian buddies and say, save us because our inventory of rockets and our command and control and our other military assets were being targeted by the Israelis in response because the Israelis could be protected. And even though the Israelis didn't have to shoot down all the rockets because some of them landed in the ocean, some landed in desert and non build up places, so a certain number didn't go where they went. Some actually went straight up off over Gaza and came straight back down. Uh, because the, the, some of the rockets are very, the Hamas is getting very good at them, but some they're not. So you, you don't just do one thing, and this, it's not just a geography <coughs> thing, it's a time thing. At a certain point, you have time to turn the tables on the other guys, which the Israelis did. Now, would that be the case of rockets in the 400 kilometer range? Like you, then you have questions of, of technologies like JLANs which we were going to operate in the Gulf, but then we didn't get host country permission, and now we're going to do a demonstration here. When you look at that technology and the way in which you can have a simple technology of a dirigible, an airstat, giving orders to multiple operators of multiple defensive systems, as well as telling your ships and your army units and Navy units in the area what's coming at them, that also changes it. So I don't think, I, I, what I disagree with is the idea the offense always wins. It didn't always win with respect to Hamas and Israel. And I'm not sure it's necessarily the case, particularly if you give enough doubt in the mind of the bad guys who have the stuff, that maybe they aren't going to win. Because, you know, if you don't have to end up fighting, that's good enough. Okay, good morning. I'm Timothy Walton with Delic Systems. Uh, a qu quick question for Professor Denny and then one for Mr. Thomas, please. Uh, Professor Denny, are there any lessons from uh, the Army air missile defense experience in Europe that you think are applicable as the Army looks to rebalance in the Asia Pacific? And then for Mr. Thomas, uh, discussions of Army air missile defense oftentimes conflate theater air missile defense with national ballistic missile defense. And oftentimes the scale of the, th the theater threat um, of cruise missiles, UAS, advanced aircraft, et cetera, is diminished and leads certain analysts to think that the area denial threat for direct land control is smaller than it is. Deployed Army forces won't be targeted by ballistic missiles, so we don't need to th worry about the problem. Let's have the rest of the joint force uh, carry a heavier burden of, of air missile defense. What are your thoughts on this, please? Hi, thanks for your question. Uh, there are lots of lessons learned, I think, but I think we could take a broader perspective and say, were there any lessons learned from American experiences in, uh, in Shiriki, in uh, Japan, or in Israel for what the U.S. is trying to do in, um, in NATO? Uh, the challenge has been really inculcating those lessons. Uh, there's evidence to indicate that uh, a lot of those lessons weren't learned, and we saw some of that and the Army's effort to establish the radar site in Curasec. It was a little more, uh, with MDA's assistance, of course, it was a little more challenging than it probably should have been. Now, are there lessons to be learned from, from Europe now uh, in expanding the phased adaptive approaches, uh, or I should say in, in creating them in the Gulf and in the Far East? Uh, definitely. I think one of the, the primary lessons, though, we would learn, at the, at the, again, at the macro level, is that uh, this is tough to do. Uh, specifically in the context of a multinational alliance. It's only going to be more challenging to do in a context of a hub-and-spoke alliance system, such as we have in the Far East. Uh, all of these advanced technologies and systems that we have in Europe right now, whether we're talking about the radar system or the Aegis cruisers or the European contributions, none of that matters unless these things can talk to each other, right? Data fusion is a critical element, a critical technological challenge for us in the European context. Now, we've got NATO... Uh, attempting to handle the C2 piece, and that is a long-term uh, effort. Uh, part of that is in place now at Ramstein, uh, the uh, 
uh, air base in, uh, in Germany. Uh, but that will remain a challenge to try to fuse all of these various sensors and indicators together in one place. I think that's going to that's going to be the the, uh, the most difficult challenge we face in the Far East and certainly in the um, in the Gulf region is trying to get our allies and our partners to talk together um, when we're doing this in a in a bilateral way. Do you want me to? Thank you. Yeah, there's one uh, just to your, to your second question, um, yeah, I mean the, the the theater, both ballistic and cruise missile uh, threat, is 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 growing um, across a number of theaters around the world, um, and this is obviously a, a problem for our allies and partners as, as as well as ourselves. And from the army's perspective, I mean, if you think in terms of the 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 driving scenario, if you will, for how we think about the use of land forces. Um, it, it, historically, um, over the last several decades, it's been thinking about uh, uh, North Korean uh, armored offensive down the peninsula, but but this this just isn't there. I mean, the real threats, uh, both in the Middle East and and in Asia, increasingly, are both missile and and artillery threats uh, that that are posed to civilian populations as well as to concentrations of military forces. Whether they're at air bases, they're at sea in large signature uh, naval combatants, uh, or the, or they're concentrated ground forces. So it's all of the above. I, what I see is that um, this is an area where we really need the army. Um, we're going to need the army not just for protecting the army, but for protecting uh, allied population centers uh, and for protecting the rest of the joint force, uh, where where it it can extend. The, the security envelope potentially uh, for those other forces. Um, and to, to Peter's comment earlier, I think it's always just going to be a question of what's the right balance going to be? Um, and today, uh, you know, we are focused singularly when it comes to uh, missile threats. We, we really are heavily imbalanced towards defenses. We have to stay in the defensive game. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not here to, to say let's get out of, 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 of missile defenses, but we really need to think about how we're going to augment that and, and come up with a better balance between offense and defense. Yeah, I got a couple questions. Uh, first question, I was wondering if you could talk about the impact of the Navy's uh, movement into land-based BMD with the Aegis Ashore and how that impacts the Army's mission. And the second question is um, if we could have a broader discussion on the impact of leaving the INF Treaty. Uh, sure. The, uh, the question first about the uh, Aegis Ashore. This was a subject of some heated debate within the Pentagon about who would uh, be responsible for those sites. Uh, it was agreed that the uh, the Navy would handle those sites. Again, as I mentioned, that even if the Navy does handle them, the primary operation responsibility, that is, uh, the Army is still going to retain some roles there. Uh, however, I suspect that if it goes beyond one or two sites, that the Army will want to revisit that, because fundamentally, defense from land is an Army mission. With uh, what we expect to be uh, phased adaptive approaches growing in the Persian Gulf and in the Far East, I think this issue will come up again. And uh, I'm at least not convinced that that will remain a Navy mission. Um, I would be careful about leaving the INF Treaty. Um, as one who still has the scars on my back when I served on the NATO desk in the early 1980s, deploying INF missiles in Europe was really, really hard. Uh, I think we came close to breaking the NATO alliance over this. And so before we lift the INF Treaty, which I think the Russians would welcome, uh, I think the Russians would like to get back into that capability, um, I think we ought to ask ourselves, you know, you know, right now INF missiles deployed in the United States could hold at risk targets in Canada and Central America. Uh, but before leaving the treaty, uh, if we're looking at the sorts of targets that we would want to be able to hold at risk, do we have bases from which we could operate? I suspect that deploying INF missiles now into NATO Europe would be hugely difficult. Uh, the, the point being made there that while we may say they have conventional warheads on, uh, there will be always this question, which the Russians would be sure to exploit, that well, maybe they have a nuclear weapon on it. Uh, would we be able to deploy these things in Japan or South Korea? 
where you would have the Russians and Chinese saying, well, this is not just a threat to North Korea, but this is also a threat to our forces. So I, I think you have to approach that question with great caution because I am dubious about the ability of the United States to find a home for those missiles where they could have uh, targets that would be within reach. Uh, I, you know, I, I share the caution. Um, I, I think that you would only exit the treaty reluctantly. Um, but, but I think again, you know, this we're we're, we're locked into this um, this mindset of when we think about our strategic forces, both offensive and defensive, uh, it's dominated by a bilateral U.S.-Russia discussion, and and I think the context really has shifted in the last uh, in, in the last 25 years, um, and and today in a global context. Um, I think we really have to uh, think hard about the, the, the continued benefits as well as the growing risks of remaining in the regime, uh, especially if there are not uh, new signatories to the, to the treaty. Um, if we can multilateralize INF, I, I think that that is a good thing not only for, from a U.S. interest standpoint but from uh, the standpoint of international peace and security. But if that can't be done, uh, and if really this is just about constraining uh, the United States and Russia in this bilateral framework, uh, is the sand, sand is shifting under our feet around the world in a number of regional balances, um, then I, th I think we're going to have to reassess. And in, in terms of where we, we base these systems, um, I, I think that uh, one, uh, it may have already, it may have almost broken the alliance in the, in, in the 1980s, but I think it was a successful gambit ultimately. And, and it ties back a little bit to Sydney's question earlier, which is, you know, are there potential zero options, options in, in other parts of the world that we might think about? Um, and I think the, the other part is that, you know, you have, I think, a number of allies and partners uh, in, in other regions of the world in the, Middle, in the Middle East and in Asia, which are increasingly concerned uh, about the shifts in, the, in the, the regional security balances there that may, in fact, be quite open to this. But I, I think it has to be dealt, uh, it has to be addressed in a very cautious and, and careful way. Uh, and I think that probably begins with some very quiet consultations with our allies and partners. Let me uh, address that as someone who um, I share the scars of INF, but I, I consider them purple hearts. Uh, I thought it was the most f fantastic uh, political fight that we won in the Cold War, uh, aside from beating the nuclear freeze, and that it unified NATO. Then if you'd gone and talked to Al Haig when we put the zero-zero option on the table, and remember, we had no money in any defense budget up to that time that had acquired Pershings and Glickums. And in fact, when we put the bill on the floor of the House, we lost 86 percent of the Democrats. And in the Senate, we lost about 80 percent of them. And it was a very tough fight. But it also unified NATO and turned the tables on the Russians. Similarly, I would look at NMD in America, for example, the third site. A lot of people in the arms control community see that aimed at Russia. It's not. Not aimed at Russia at all. The thing is that if a rocket comes out of the ocean 600 kilometers off the coast of the United States, off the coast of Venezuela, surreptitiously, and it has an EMP warhead on it, as Speaker Gingrich said yesterday, if the Chinese launch a submarine off the coast of North Korea with an EMP warhead, who did it? And we need defenses from the, the southern, the, the North Korean rocket launch recently went the southern route. With a very small change in its azimuth, that satellite, which was probably an empty box that they launched, could have gone right over the central United States. So that the idea that the threats we face are Russian-centric or that we have to treat them that way, I think puts us in a box of not being able to defend ourselves against things we have to defend ourselves against. Does that mean we defend CONUS? Yes. Is that NMD? That's what you want to call it. But it's not aimed at Russia, certainly. And I don't think it should be part of the calculation and the strategic balance, because if we're going to defend ourselves against cruise missiles, which ironically the Rumsfeld Commission in 98 said was the number one missile threat in the world. They basically were basically the view, we don't know how to deal with it. It's very expensive to, to stop it. These things can proliferate. They can be shot out anywhere. But it is true. And if anything you then build in CONUS that's going to be called NMD, 
and therefore comes has to come under that rubric of oops, it's going to upset the Russians or it's going to upset the Chinese because it's going to quote unquote affect their deterrent. We'll put ourselves in a cul-de-sac out of which we can't get. We will not build things. And then the threats will get worse. And I think um, I, I very much agree with what uh, Jim says and, and uh, how do you get out of that box. But also Steve Pfeiffer is not incorrect in that the Russians will see this in a certain way. And we want to make sure that that relationship doesn't get out of hand as well, particularly given the kind of Russian, I don't know whether it's rhetorically frivolous or actually doctrinaire frivolous view of how to use nuclear weapons in a crisis. Because as you know, then Mark Schneider testified the Russians 15 times in the last four years have threatened the use of nuclear weapons against our allies in NATO and our in America for one reason. Now, you can just say it's rhetoric. My worry is that the rhetoric will begin to inform policy. And as the Russians have said, they're more and more relying on nuclear weapons while we are moving away from that. And I think that's something we have to be very, very careful about. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you all again very much for joining us here today. Let me also, before we go, uh, thank Peter, uh, who was, uh, as you know from the program, a stand-in as our chair today and a last-minute one at that. So, Peter, thank you very much for your uh, performing the chair duties. And uh, let me again thank the ROA and Bob Fiedler and my co-panelists. We appreciate you coming today.